Okay guys, so we're gonna do a video today that's about reverb, and it has to do with this little home-built amp that I put together a while back. And this amp is, well, it's a couple different things. It's uh, an amp that was based uh, on the AB763 Blackface amp um, normal tone stack. Um, instead of having multiple inputs, it just has the single input, and then it has the volume, treble, and bass that you'd have in just the normal channel from any of the AB763 Blackface Fender amps. And then it also has the AB763 Reverb, the Transformer uh, Reverb, um, and it does have a vintage uh, Accutronics tank, which you can see down in there. Down in the back, you can see the little Accutronics thing. It's the 1122 stamped uh, Accutronics tank. That was the tank that was used in all of the blackface amps, pretty much. Could also be, um, could be labeled Gibbs. Um, Gibbs, basically, uh, it, that was an Accutronics tank as well. So if it says Gibbs 1122, Accutronics 1122, anyway, it's the same tank. And that was used in all the blackface amps. And so that's what this amp is, although it's a little unusual in that this amp, the power section is not two 6V6s. This is a, a large bottle uh, amplifier. So it's a two 6L6 amp. So imagine if you had like a, a super reverb, like a Fender super reverb, uh, but instead of four 10 inch speakers, you just had a single 10 inch speaker, 34 watts. That's basically what this amp is. 5U4 rectifier, two 6L6s, and then it has a um, 12AX7 phase inverter, but the rest of the preamp is, like, like I said, directly out of any of the AB763 fenders. And you'll notice it's, uh, it's pretty small. Uh, that is a one by 12 combo behind it. You can see the difference. This is a very small amp. That's a sour mash cabinet. I just got that. I'm building another amp pretty soon and it's going to go in there and uh, why does it say sony well the reason it says sony on it is because that cabinet that it's in came out of a sony reel-to-reel -reel tube uh real well it's a reel-to-reel -reel tape player and it had a stereo um tube amp in it it's called the the sony tape quarter and since I used the cabinet from it, I decided that I would put the Sony logo on it. I call it the Franken Sony. And what happened to the amp that was in it? Why didn't I just use the amp that was inside the Sony? Well, that was the amp that was inside the Sony. And the reason I didn't use it is because it's not really a great amplifier for guitar amps. The way that this works is split right down the middle here You'll see it's kind of a mirror image on either side. You have one, one channel, because this is a two-channel stereo amp. One channel is a single-ended amp this way, the other single-ended amp that way for each of the two channels. So it was a stereo uh, recorder. And so what I've done instead is I've repurposed this, um, and this isn't the original configuration of this. I mean, this whole thing had a huge other part of the chassis, and I've connected it together and kind of moved stuff around and all the rest of it, but now I use it um, to stream music through it. And it sounds great. It's got a, a little Bluetooth receiver back here, right there. And then that just goes in the, the input, right? Your two channels onto the input. And then those are the original speakers that were on the sides of this thing. And it, it, you wouldn't believe how amazing this thing sounds. I mean, even through those tiny original little speakers, it's just amazing. So anyway, that was what was in it. But I just kept looking at this thing with the handle on it and going, man, that would, that's perfect for a guitar amp. Well, I probably should have done a very small amp and, and, and put a very small amplifier in there, but instead I got really ambitious and this was the first build that I ever did. One of the things that's weird about it, the reverb is super, 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 uh, saturated. It's way, way, it gets, it gets uh, too echoey, too cavernous, too quickly. It's something that's pretty common uh, in some of the Fender amps, um, but there's ways that we can, 
there's ways that we can that we can deal with that and that's what this video is going to be about we're going to try and tame that reverb i'll give you an example of what the reverb sounds like um, now and then we'll compare it uh, after we've done the mods and you can decide uh, if this is a mod that you may want to do for your own amp so let me play you a little section of what the reverb sounds like right now so at the volume it may be i don't know three because <laughs> this is a very loud amplifier so i'm going to just keep the volume pretty low and uh, this is without reverb tell oh my god try that again incredibly uh, voluminous that is. Now watch if I turn this up, just maybe say halfway. I mean, you, that's just way, way, way oversaturated in terms of that reverb. Uh, you know, I mean, if you're doing a special effect thing, um, I suppose you could have the reverb do that. <laughs> That's a little much, right? That's a little much. I mean, really usable reverb is probably in this, it, this is about as high as you'd want to go. But uh, that's the problem that we've got here. Okay, so here's uh, the inside of the R amp. As you can see, it's point-to-point -point wiring. There are no tag boards. And you can also tell that we've got a lot of stuff that's really crammed in here pretty tight. And, you know, for an amp that's got reverb, you know, this is a fairly small chassis. Um, <laughs> normally, it would be a little wider, and it would probably be a little bit longer. Um, but it, it actually works out pretty well, and you'd be surprised. I mean, it's, it's a pretty quiet amp. Um, for having everything crammed in, you know, uh, into such a small space. Okay, so this right here is our reverb pot. And like we said, we want to try to find a way to, you know, make it so that our reverb doesn't come on as strongly as quickly. Okay, and one of the ways that we're going to do that is we can, we can swap out this pot with a different style of pot. Um, this is, this pot is a 100K and it's a linear taper. And so what does that mean? So what a linear taper means is that it tends to get, you know, the sweep of adjustment tends to come up um, a little bit more quickly than say does an audio taper pot. And that's what this particular one is. This is a 100K audio taper pot. And what we're gonna try and do is swap those out and see if maybe, you know, we get to be at maybe five or six before our reverb gets to be too um, oversaturated and it sounds like you know we're in some murky tunnel instead of just that little bit of echo that we're looking for. Okay let's take a look at the schematic for a second um, that's similar to the amp that we're talking about. This is a, an AB763 schematic for the Super Reverb amp. That was the big 26L6 bottled uh, Fender amp that had the four 10-inch speakers in it right and this is the this is the schematic. One of the differences with my amp is that mine has a 5U4 rectifier, not a GZ34. Um, and of course mine, you know, mine only has w the one high gain uh, normal input. It doesn't have the two normal inputs or the vibrato channel. So all of this stuff, and then all of this stuff over here for the vibrato, all that stuff is not actually in my amp. But this part down here certainly is. This is the 
this is basically the reverb circuit right here. So the dry signal comes across from up above, okay, on the schematic here. Comes through here, goes through this little uh, 500 picofarad capacitor, and it goes directly into the grid of this 12AT7. This is the tube where the plates are tied together. So 12AT7 is the same, it's a, sa it's a dual triode, uh, same as like, you know, 12AX7, 12AU7, 12AY7. And, um, uh, but it does have a lower amplification factor than a 12AX7, uh, whereas a 12, whereas a 12AX7 is around 100, um, you know, real powerful dual triode um, am um, amplifying tube. This one is only about, um, this one's 40% lower. This one's about um, um, an amplification factor of 60, I guess. And uh, so this is not as strong a tube as a 12AX7. And this is the one that they use, right? And so this, the, your dry signal comes in here, goes into the grid, and then the plate signal comes out, goes through the reverb transformer, through the reverb unit, and then comes over here into the recovery tube. This says 7025, but in my amplifier, they're all 12AX7s where it says 7025. And then over here, you can see this is where it has the 100K linear pot, okay? So we're gonna change this one to an audio taper. So we're gonna do a 100K A, right? audio taper pot. I'm going to give that a try first. But the other thing that we might want to try too is if that turns out that that's not enough, you'll notice as the dry signal comes down here and goes into the grid of the first tube for the reverb circuit, you also have this um, resistor here, this one meg resistor that goes to ground. Basically what that's doing is it's it's taking a little bit of the dry signal that would go into the grid here and be sent along, right, to get the wet signal, uh, the reverb added to it, right? And this is basically bleeding off some of it to ground in this one meg resistor. So this acts sort of like a dwell control. You've seen dwell on some amplifiers. Well, if you wanted to, you could literally even just put, well, you could put an adjustable resistor, right? A variable resistor here, like some kind of a trim pot if you wanted. And then you could sort of you know, even have that accessible, like, I don't know, on the back of the, the chassis or something like that, and you could adjust the amount of dwell. Um, or you can just say, well, if, if you want to reduce a little bit of the signal going in to begin with, you could probably make this not as high a value of resistance. You know, you could lower the resistance. Um, so that's one thing that you could do. Um, if you have, if you feel that the reverb is too strong, you could probably reduce the value of this particular resistor as well. But we're going to try this first, okay? And then if it's not enough, we could try doing something with this resistor as well. You know, one other thing that you could do, I suppose, is you could, you might be able to change the tube out too. Now, this reverb circuit's designed to run a 12AT7. Like I said, it has an amplification factor of 60. You could maybe put an AY7 in there. That has a slightly lower amplification factor of about 40. And that could also maybe reduce um, you know, the signal as it's going through here. So as it, so the dry signal comes through, goes through the tube, goes through the transformer, goes through the reverb beam, comes into the recovery, and then of course, you have your control over here, right? But as it comes up, then you'll see where it comes up and it blends in back in with this dry signal. It goes through a 3.3 um, a meg resistor and a 10 picofarad um, capacitor here. And this is where they sort of, this is where it blends with the dry signal before it goes into the grid of the next amplification stage, the next gain stage. Um, so that's sort of the way that the that the reverb uh, works in these amps, in these AB763 amps. So we'll try to change the pot first. If that's not enough, then we'll try to mess with our, I don't know what I'll call it, a dwell resistor over here. We maybe can lower that a little bit and get to where we need it to be. Um, I'm not so sure how much changing the tube to a slightly lower amplification would do I wonder about how much is actually required, how much amplification is actually required to drive this circuit. You know, if Fender was saying, well, something that's an amplification factor of 60 is what we're gonna use, 
it may that it may be that if you go to an AY7, it may not be enough amplification to really drive the reverb unit effectively. I don't know. I've never done it. I've changed out other gain stage um, tubes, but I've never messed with them in the fender circuit. So I don't really know about changing out this tube and whether or not that would ha that would make any difference. But I think for now, we're just going to try the pot, make that an audio taper pot, same value, 100K. And then we'll mess with this and we'll see if that makes any difference. And we'll go from there. Okay, so actually, before I begin doing this little operation, um, obviously this amp is unplugged. This amp is had has had uh, the all of the large electrolytic capacitors. They've all been discharged. Okay, and um, you may be asking, well, why do we do that? Well, we do that so that we can work safely inside of a tube amp. Um, you know, even if the tube amp has been unplugged, it can still store charge uh, in these electrolytics for a certain amount of time. So what I usually do is, you know, take a clip, clip it onto the chassis, go to the positive end of any of your electrolytics, especially the big filter caps, right? And you go and you just hold that on there for a couple seconds. And then these, all these little tiny ones in here, can go and do these, and do those. And then once that's done, then you can safely work inside the amp, okay? So, and uh, anytime you actually have the amp up and you're working on it, um, and uh, you need to, you know, sort of mess around in here and move stuff, check your lead dress, see if you can try to find a hum in, a, in, in something, or see if there's a got a loose connection or something. Use something that's non-metallic. Use a chopstick. I use one of these little plastic dealy doos that I got. I think this was like in a battery kit for a cell phone or something. But uh, yeah, it's cool because, you know, it's got a little tip on it and it's not sharp. Um, but it's plastic, so it doesn't conduct. Anything that's non-conductive, do not use a screwdriver. I don't care if it has, you know, oh, I'm holding it by the handle, it's plastic. No, nothing metallic. Because even if it doesn't shock you, if you're moving something around and it slips and it's metallic, you know, you can end up welding that thing in there because you've done a short circuit across, you know, 400 volts. Just don't do it. This is mid just, no, mid don't do it. Okay, so anyway, lecture over. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do a little desoldering here on our pot. And I just, I really like this solder sucker. I've had this thing for so many years, it's just, it's gotten to be silly how long I've had this darn thing. Probably since the 90s. Before I even knew how to do any of this stuff. So we're just going to get this pot out of there, and then we will put in the new pot, and we'll give that a go. So this is the old pot, alpha. See how it says B100K? That's a linear. And we have the alpha that is the audio taper one in here now. Okay, there it is. It's all hooked up. Let's put this back. Let's put the chassis back in the amp. We'll fire it up. We'll give a keen listen to our reverb and we'll see if that's enough. We'll see if that's enough of a fix. It could be, you know? Um, you know, some people, you know, this is a very subjective thing. You know, some people like an incredibly cavernous sounding reverb. I don't want that much. You know, when you play chords and you do other things, a lot of times it just gets so muddy that, you know, the individual notes, they just tend to blur together and, you know, they're not articulate enough. So this might fix it, might not. If it doesn't, again, you know, we have a resistor that we can mess with too. So for now, we're done. We're going to take this inside. We're going to put it in the amp. We're going to listen to it. Okay. <laughs> So here we got the amp. Again, I'm probably on about three. Right? So let's try a little bit of the reverb. Wow. Let's listen to that. So 
it's it's not it's much better than it was <laughs> taper pot obviously makes a difference. It doesn't get as crashy as quickly, but it's still a little too much. Um, I think we're going to have to mess with that dwell resistor, right? That resistor that, that is, you know, taking some of that initial dry signal and shunting it off to ground. I think what we're going to do is we're going to probably make that, we're going to change that resistor value. Right now it's a one meg. So what I'm thinking that we're going to do in order to get more of that, that, that dry signal, I think what we're going to do is we're going to take that resistor and we're going we're gonna to have more of that. We want more of the dry signal to go to ground. This resistor, which was a one meg, right? That was the one that goes to ground. And it comes off of the grid of the tube that drives the reverb, right? And so we're going to substitute that. And I think what I'm going to do is instead of a one meg, I've got over here some uh, 820K ohm metal film resistors. So I think what I'll do is I'll take one of these and I'll put that in the place of the one meg, and we'll see if we can bleed off a little bit more of that dry before it goes into um, our tank and see what sort of a change that does. As I mentioned, you know, we could put, you could put a pot in here, right? And you could, you could put a pot that, you know, you either adjust from the back of the chassis or someplace or even inside the chassis, you know, like if you wanted to do it like a bias adjustment or something like that, if you had a fixed bias amp. But I don't have a lot of room in this amp. So um, it's, and it's also probably a setting that I'm probably not going to worry that much about. I've already got it improved much more than it was. I have a feeling that this is going to be just enough. If it turns out to my ear that it hasn't really made much of a change or anything else, well, I'll probably just leave it alone and I'll just live with the reverb where it is. Um, I could experiment going, you know, a little bit uh, lower value uh, later on, but chances are, I think that this is going to be, this will be the fix. It's really difficult getting in here and making these kinds of changes on this amplifier. So... You know, if it was the type, you know, where I had a tag board and everything was all laid out and it was a little bit easier to get to things, you know, I could probably spend more time doing it, but I don't think I'll do that. Okay, so let me show you. This is our, this is our new 820K ohm um, resistor here. This is the one that's going to act as our dwell, okay? It goes from this lug right here, okay? That's, this is the one, this, this wire right here goes into tube socket just below it and it's the grid of the tube driver and then this of course goes over to this lug over here and that lug is attached to ground so this used to be a one meg now it is a 820 k ohm and we're going to give this a shot and see how it works all right so here we are hopefully at the end of our journey I do not have a standby switch. I don't believe in standby switches on amps that have two rectifiers. I don't see the point. So, let's not give away anything. Three. 
Okay. This is at five. <laughs> This is at seven. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of reverb, right? But it's still usable up until probably about eight now. If you want to sound like you're in a cavern. But that's where it should be when it's, you know, at that level. Right? Thanks for watching.